Do I have a clue where I am? Not a freaking clue. I guess if I was at home, I'd call this a logging road I'm on. Very, I'm up in the hills. I'm up at the highest point I think I could find. I'm a worming my, my way around these dirt roads. And um, I'm definitely off, off the main, off the main track. So, this is freaking jungle. It remind, the jungle here reminds me a lot of the jungle I hunt actually was in in New Zealand. Looks a lot, a lot like it is on the South Island, the West Coast of it, but yeah, it's pretty wild. I think if anything, I'll probably put a, uh, probably put the GoPro on the front for the ride out of here. I don't know which way I'm going to go to get out of here, but you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to send up the drone and I'm going to show you guys where I am. Watch this. All right, it's just going to be me and that annoying bird out the window again, and uh, I had to bail due to mosquitoes. <laughs> I had no bug dope with me, and um, I almost died from a mosquito over here. So, I wasn't too cool in hanging out in that patch of timber. You even call palm trees timber? Coconut trees timber? I don't know. But anyway, I had to check it out and bail out. So, you're back to this regular shit again. But either way, people are going to get hurt, right? So it doesn't matter. Now, where should I go? I haven't got it. Usually I'll just like mark out make sure that the videos I'm about to glance at are are not like rants of other topics, which a lot of the emails are. Holy shit. I get so many watch this video emails. It's stupid. I get so many. Uh, I get tons of. I get a shit pile of different topics emailed to me nonstop. And most of the time I just copy and paste the emails into my notes on my phone. And then I go through them and then I realize, oh shit, this is unrelated. Oh shit, that's unrelated. So, no, I don't pre-read the whole email, but I do glance at it to make sure it's somebody's experience before I share it right here. So, I'll read, I'll, I'll I don't know, I'll, I'll cover about maybe five or six of them, and then I'll get let a number them one to six, and then I'll let it rip on here, and I have done that. So, I'm winging it. This is titled Revelation After Watching Episode with Mr. Ash, Ojibwe Elder. All right. This is an older one, I think. That was from Cooch. Well, let's go find out if I read this or not. Steve Cujo here. Regarding the email from Mr. Ash, I think there's definitely something to what he was saying about the beings coming to you when you close your eyes and are getting ready to go to sleep. I've experienced something similar, but not with the beings. At times when I'm dozing off at night, eyes closed, dark room, I can make out movement. Shapes of people, faces, but no sounds. It's like looking at a muted black and white movie through a thin black cloth. It's not a dream because I'm aware of what's happening. I can hear the sounds of my bedroom, the ticking clock, my daughter's music in the next room over, etc. And I've been startled while this happens because sometimes a face just appears when I'm trying to to figure out what I'm looking at. Like I was looking at a dirty door security peephole and someone quickly put their eye in on the opposite side. I used to write it off to the TV negative. Sorry. I used to write it off to the TV negative. That's there after that's there after you close your eyes after turning off the TV. Okay, I get it. I get it. Picking up what you're putting down. But then I started to recognize what I was seeing. And it's different from what I was just watching. And I have no control of it. Sometimes it's people moving about. Sometimes the city streets. Sometimes the outdoors. And it only happens when I'm completely relaxed and in that place right before I go to sleep. I think maybe this is what true psychics see. Maybe they can control it. Control what, when, and where they want to see it. And maybe this is how the beings can make that spiritual adoption. I'm not sure of anything except I'm not sure of anything except there is so much we do not know and maybe this explains some of it. Maybe it's another dimension like ours and the beings can go in and out as they please which explains why they disappear, why footprints just stop, etc. It would actually explain a lot of things, ghosts, alien abductions, etc. Anyway, I just had this revelation after watching your latest episode. Good thing I'm retired. 
If not, my superiors would have me put on a desk awaiting psychological testing if they knew I thought this way. Oh, well. God bless Cujo. Yeah, no shit, eh, Cujo? No shit. That's the shitty thing about society today. When we come forward with all this stuff, we get labeled. You get labeled. People think you're crazy. Not fair, is it? That's kind of different, you know. Uh... I can't really relate to that myself, but one thing I did take note of for a handful of years is like I'm not a I'm not a napper kind of person. I don't have naps, but a few times that I fell asleep in the afternoon, just when I'm going through that transition of waking up, I would feel absolute nasty ass dread and despair and sadness. It's just a real weird, weird, shitty transition. I, I couldn't explain it. I couldn't figure it out. And it got to the point I was almost like dreading if I ever to ever take a nap. I don't know what the hell that was about. I don't think I've, ex I've experienced it for a while, but I, don't, I know it's not related to what you're saying, but it kind of made me think of that for a second. I'm babbling a bit. Now, thanks for sending that in, Cooch. I, I hope, I'm sorry I didn't get, get to it for so long, but you got buried in the stack, right? Now, what else do we got? Okay, here's a short one. It's titled Kyle. Okay, hold on a minute. Well, your title is red, so I don't screw this up and read it twice. Very short. Kyle Baker also. The deeper you go, the crazier it gets. No wonder they stay on tracks and beating on trees. If you know they exist and stay on the, quote, we need more proof, end quote, train, you're actually part, of, probably part of the problem. Wolf on dog. All right, Kyle, Kyle, thanks for pointing that one out. I think we, I think we know that one, but there you go. You've been heard, my man. You've been heard. And I can relate to what you just said for sure. All right, you guys can tell I'm a little unorganized here, right? Here's another one. All right, this one's titled Possible Beings in Ohio. Possible, more like shit piles in Ohio. Stephen, following your channel and the, value, and the various stories you share with everyone for several months now. You're the most honest fellow for people's stories without a shred of doubt which offers support instead of maybe ridicule. Really, I want you to know that you're a true supporter of souls for sharing and posting the most horrid experiences that deal with the rather unexplained. And this compelled me to share through you. Thank you. Thank you for the kind words, man. And I am glad this is working. This is rather long, but it is about as accurate as I remember. Like yesterday. I had an experience in 91 from little known Meigs County, Ohio. M-E-I-G-S. I've also come to realize that this experience that I have shared with no single person for 30 years may actually be related to these beings that I've become more aware of now and start to very seriously consider. My name is Keith and I grew up in the more simple times of the late 70s through early 90s on a small hobby farm of 50 acres in southeast Ohio, not far from the Ohio River. I think I'm a rather rational person that has been able to explain many odd experiences over the years, but this experience was locked in my mind for many years now and it is time to unlock it. I'm actually nervous typing this now. It was the week after Thanksgiving in Ohio, which meant whitetail hunting. Our 50-acre farm boarded larger farms that had given permission to hunt with a simple phone call every time. This allowed me to roam about 500 acres of land in the crazy pursuit of whitetail monsters for years. Oh man, lucky dude. I was a senior in high school at the time and always spent as much time as possible scouting most of the year leading up to the season. My preferred method of take was a Winchester Model 120 Ranger pump in 20 gauge shooting old school Foster slugs. Not the best, however, it was a very effective weapon out to 50 yards that took many deer for years as a gift from my dad. I still have it. I dabbled in bow hunting in previous years, but gun season was the best. Deer, deer season was Monday morning through Saturday, only six days, and I tried every evening after school. We had Monday off from school as a token day of hunting from the school district. As the week went by in the 91 season, I was just not set up right while still hunting to get the heavy eight pointer I watched all summer and fall in the crop fields. It was the final day and I was feeling the need to take a deer to make my effort count. Call it a meal deer. 
My strategy was to set up on the neighbor's fence line to hopefully catch the group of does that always bed in there during the day. It was 3.30 in the afternoon when I was set up on the opposite side of a hollow with a direct line to a clearing at 30 yards. Perfect, I thought. The light fades quickly at this point in the day and I realized that no one else was hunting on the neighbor's parcel to pressure deer movement. Bad luck. At nearly last light to legally shoot a deer, I was blessed with a string of five does coming out at one at a time from the fence line with a simple silent hop. I steadied on the largest mature doe right behind her shoulder and low, easy, I thought. I pulled the trigger thinking all was good, but my round did not drop her like I thought it would. She stumbled and ran back the way she came through the fence with the other does scattering. I waited for about five minutes, dropped my backpack with only the shotgun before walking over to that area. Blood, lots of it. I was feeling good about a short tracking, but this is where things got totally bizarre for me over the next two hours. The trail was easy to follow with lots of deer sign and a clear indication that I would find my doe. I was thinking about the time of the day the light left and wanted to close the day with success without field dressing in the dark. I quickly tracked her for about 60 yards to an area that was clearly the last place the, this, this poor doe was. But there was no deer to be found anywhere. What struck me was the amount of blood in that eight foot area all over the ground and leaf litter. She was certainly not far away. I searched in circles around that area until finally picking up a small amount of blood at two feet up a tree trunk. All right, I remember the story, but I'm gonna follow through anyway. We have a lot of new people here. I thought it unusual at the time the 10 yard circle would not produce a deer, but I also knew that whitetails can actually have nine lives like a cat if not taken properly. At this point, I was feeling bad about my shot placement for the sake of a quick kill. I followed the trail noting that the blood was actually along tree trunks. Instead, of the signs and the leaves in the ground. Unusual. Yeah, I'd think I'd probably turn around right there today. If that happened to me today, I'd be out of there. <laughs> I just thought that she had a second wind at living again and pressed on the trunks along the trail to hold her upright and steady. At this point, it was about an hour after pulling the trigger with darkness falling. I trailed another 100 yards up to the West Virginia pulp and paper owned parcel to find blood on the top fence wire and post. I pulled out my small flashlight to help guide me at this point with very little light left. I was amazed at the time that a severely wounded deer would clear that fence. She wanted to live. This property was new territory for me, but I had to find that doe for sure. I followed through some very thick brush for several yards and approached a large white oak not 30 yards beyond the fence that had less brush around it. As I stood up fully to survey, I felt very uncomfortable instantly and swept side to side with the light. To this day, I can remember the weakness in my knees and the instant fear that made my feet feel stuck in place, meaning something was not right from a sixth sense. I noticed blood on the tree with the light showing more up the trunk. I can remember my eyes following up the trunk with immediate disbelief. In the fork of this white oak, at 15 to 20 feet up was my deer. She was right there with her hind half toward me. There was fresh blood on the oak bark all the way up dripping wet and a million questions started flooding my mind. I was without explanation at this point and staring at this situation while a ringing started in my head from emotion. This area in Ohio does not have large cats or black bears that may have stashed my doe. So, this had my brain on pause. A second wave of fear came over me as I realized I was not alone. There was something just beyond and to the left of this large oak I have stared at for the last two minutes. With all my might, I panned the light to the left to see the outline of something large and dark in color through a thick patch of multi-floral rose bushes. After 30 seconds of no movement and a small amount of courage to scare off this bear, I said, hey, directly toward this outline, hoping to see my first one near the farm. The outline acted startled, slowly started moving away from me and standing up at the same time to find that I was looking at something over eight feet tall, no sound. At this point, I was a mess. 
that I almost pissed myself as I'm watching this unfold. You probably did. <laughs> I would have. Frozen and fixated with a weak flashlight, I felt vulnerable in that moment like nothing before or since. Terrified. After another minute and losing the outline of this thing up the bank and out of light range, I tore off in the direction I came, tossing the flashlight as I fled. I was never known to be fast in high school, but that night I was, was a running personal best back the way I came to our property. I continued running back to where I sat still hunting earlier and picked up my backpack at a brisk pace. I, I ran the remaining half a mile back to the pole barn, just 50 yards from the house without breaking a stride. My lungs were on fire, and I could taste my own blood from my lungs with the stress running. I then sat there, recovering with a final release of emo with a final release of emotion settled in. I clocked to myself and realized that I could not explain what just happened over the last half hour. No explanation. And, there, and they would not believe me. And that feeling when I looked up in the tree and out past to see this thing, dreadful. Steve, I'd roamed these small hills in this neck of the woods for years with no explanation, explanation at all, at all, as to what happened or what I saw. None. I decided to cap it off in that moment and not tell anyone of what happened that last day of deer season in 1991. My parents both noted something wrong when I got back to the house after dark, so I acted frustrated about losing a possible shot on a deer. I did lose the deer. My mother asked again the next morning before going to church, but I just could not tell her what really happened. We don't have that kind of critters in Ohio that can do this, and assume for the bulk of my adult life, this was a huge bear. Maybe it's the only huge black bear sighting in Ohio. But this was an eight foot tall and silent bear. Bobcats are not able to drag a deer up like that either. Still thinking about it to this day. There's been th that has been 30 years ago, and I decided to share through you with the folks after your readings of various experiences. Steve, I was terrified in that moment, and have tried to justify what this was over the years. I'm now almost 50, and had trouble explaining this to myself when I did think about it. It took two years for me to get back out chasing deer again after that season, and fortunately have not had another experience like it. I did return to the same area, sorry, I did return to the same tree in 94 during a daytime walking hunt just to say to myself that I could do it. After 20 minutes of searching, I did find that old flashlight about five yards away from the tree. Nothing unusual happened at all, and my confidence came back to me shortly after. Each time I go out, I go out at the old farm. I still take note of my senses each time. Strong habits since then. I now live in Colorado and go back often to meet family and friends in the occasional deer hunt. Writing this email has really had an impact on me with a final release. Hard to explain. I'm still going through videos from your channel to catch up and change my way of thinking about these, these possible beings. I'm very curious to know if you or any others ever had such an experience while hunting. All the very best, Keith. You know what, Keith? I don't think I read this. We read, I read one so similar to this, it was ridiculous. This is sent in March 25th, 2022. I didn't read this one. Man, well, I'll tell you what. Um, seeing a bear in the woods, the flashlight doesn't keep anybody out of the woods that long, does it? You know what you saw. 110%, you know what you saw. We do, too. What a weird thing it did. I mean, that thing, that being, that forest person, whatever it was, it could have just grabbed that doe by the neck and bolted for about 500 yards to put 500 yards in between you and it in seconds of it felt like. I wonder why it just hung the deer up and settled back and waited for you. That's pretty weird, isn't it? Pretty intimidating, too. Pretty freaking... That scared the living shit out of anybody. Crazy. I'm glad you went back in the woods. I'm glad you still go back in the woods. And uh, just so you know, I know people personally who have seen these things in Colorado too. So, But then again, they've been seen in every state and every province, right? So, be safe out there. I hope you don't lose any more deer to them. It's one of my worst nightmares. A couple of big bucks I've been after for a few years. Is unfortunately, they are, they are in one of the most... Um, I don't know what you, what you call it. All I know is I share that forest with these beings. There's no question about it. And I always wonder if if I do uh, get an arrow on one of these big bucks, if 
the chance. I, I always wonder. I, I, have, I run that little nightmare through my mind the other time of how shitty it would be if I finally connected and uh, all of a sudden the blood trail ended and the barefoot print started, right? They took your deer. That would suck ass. But anyway, I'm sure I'm glad this is helping, man. I'm sure I'm glad it helped you. It's helping a shit pile of other people, too. And you writing in helps a pile of people, too, right? This channel's nothing with all you guys. You guys made it. All right. This next one is titled, Steve Isdall YouTube Posts. I never saw anything but in May or June of 74, I was going stream fishing in northern New Mexico with my dad, my oldest sister, and her best friend. We had rented a cabin on a private property abutting the Santa Fe National Forest on the Rio de, la Cla Rio de la Casa, about five miles west of Cleveland, New Mexico. We had rented the cabin for three nights, and on the second day, we had hit the stream hard in the morning and come back to the cabin at noon for lunch. After we ate, we were sitting on the benches on the front porch of the cabin, taking a break and talking about the fishing and the riding as my sister and her friend were riding horses off the ranch and onto the National Forest into the high country, 8 to 10,000 feet above sea level. We were just being lazy, almost falling, falling asleep, when below us in the river bottom, less than 100 yards away, we heard the craziest sound you could imagine. It was a guttural grunting sound, kind of like two bulls fighting through a fence except terribly loud for about 20 seconds followed by a shattering deep loud scream that lasted about another 15 to 20 seconds the hair on your neck and head and arms stood straight up and everyone jumped up with a sense of dread and said what in the hell was that nobody had ever heard anything remotely similar to those noises and they kind of filled us with a fear of the unknown i ran around the cabin to try to look down into the river bottom but I couldn't see anything because a narrow apple orchard blocked my view and whatever screamed seemed to be on the other side of the apple orchard. That scream seemed to almost haunt us as the ladies decided not to go back out riding in the afternoon and my dad and I kept our eyes and ears open as we fished and we even gave it up well before dark when the fishing got really good. After fi fixing some trout, we caught for supper and playing some cards while we went to sleep. My dad and I on twin beds, and my sister and her friend on pallets put together on the floor, covered with sheets and blankets. We passed what we thought was an uneventful night until I woke around 5.30 and needed to go down to the outhouse. As I got up, I noticed the girls on the floor were covered up in their blankets and whimpering. When I asked them if they were all right, they asked in, they asked in tearful voices if it was gone. When I asked them what was gone, they said, it. They said about 3.30 they woke up to something creeping up the back landing and opening the kitchen door, then walking across the kitchen floor. The way the floor joist creaked, it must have been a tremendous weight. They said it looked down on them from the kitchen doorway, and it was huge and hairy and filled the entire doorway and had to stoop to look down at them. They said they were so filled with fear they were unable to call out or scream and just huddled under the covers. They never heard it leave as they just waited to be killed in their beds, and the next thing they were aware of was me asking if they were all right. My dad and I flipped out when we heard this tale because we were not ten feet away, and he had a pistol beside his bed, and we were very light sleepers, and had not seen or heard anything since the scream the day before, and we slept right through this incident, maybe a little too soundly. Coincidentally, myself and three friends were camping out in May of 71, about four miles northwest of this location at Walker Flats, when we climbed up a box canyon into the wilderness. And all the time we were on top, I had that most urgent feeling that I needed to leave now and go back down the mountain now. I didn't leave for two hours, but I was so uneasy I couldn't think of anything but getting the hell out of there. I've hunted and fished and been in the outdoors 60 or 7 years, and these are the only experiences I've had to spoil my times outdoors, except I've heard wood knocks sometimes and was only made aware of what they might mean from the emails on your forum. I was also usually carrying a 30 odd 6 or an 8 mil Remington Magnum, so I probably didn't have the good sense to be scared. We don't have grizzly in New Mexico anymore. Keep up the good work, and I hope you might gain some insights or knowledge from my... from... from 
my one very unusual experience, which I have to assume must have been a Sasquatch. My brother-in-law is an extreme outdoorsman, and he also has some related experiences. However, I'll let him tell his own story if he so desires. You can, you, you can use my name if you like. Regards to keep chipping away at the veils of secrecy. Bob Parsons. P.S. I find it interesting that the spell check on this iPad will not fill in when you try to, t when you try to spell Sasquatch, but you must spell it all by yourself as if it didn't exist, unlike, say, Unicorn. <laughs> Okay, that sounds, I think I read this one, but I don't give a shit. I, I read it again. And I think uh, just between this and the other channel, 10,000 new subscribers showed up this month. But anyway, I wonder if you did. I, did you, I wonder if you, if you're still listening to us, I wonder if you did send this off um, to your partner. Who was it again? Uh, my brother-in-law. Yeah, I wonder if you sent this off to your brother-in-law or not. And if, if you didn't send this off to him now and... Uh, It'll probably need jerk him into wanting to, wanting to uh, send us in his experience, right? It's endless, you guys. It's endless. I'm gonna go back up to the top of the list again because I'm too scared. I'm gonna reread. I don't. I do not have a clue how emails end up in my unread notes because I. You can hear me. I, re I label them as red before I start, and then I move them all, all the emails titled with red, I move into a folder titled red, and they're out of my face. But they keep showing up as unread. Unless everybody sent them in a million times, which does happen often, right? All right, I found this little trail going off into the timber here. Some uh, locals working up on the hill with some lawn uh, weeders by the sound of it, clearing out the underbrush. And uh, it was quite windy. It's the only place I could find where there isn't wind. It's kind of shelter on the back side of this mountain. But I was riding underneath these big uh, coconut trees. And it suddenly, and it's really windy, and it suddenly dawned on me. I'm like, oh yeah, coconuts kill people like crazy. And uh, I was going along underneath all these trees thinking, holy shit, would that ever suck? If you got beamed in the head by a coconut from 40 feet in the air, right? Look at that. Wouldn't feel too good. And that's a dried out uh, dead one. Those are big, solid, water-filled green ones. They weigh way more than these things. Crazy. Anyway, this is not a bad spot to set up and get some voices heard from around the other side of the planet, is it? Cool. So here I am, on the other side of the planet. And right now I think everybody's probably asleep <laughs> back home. I think I can get comfy. I gotta, I gotta get comfortable so I can sit here and relax and read and watch my back trail for any slithery bastards that want to come and take a chunk out of my ass. One second here. Okay, I just changed my mind. <laughs> I found this patch of, uh, I guess they're coconut trees. There's big green, huge coconut trees everywhere. And uh, it's actually the first time I actually thought about getting nervous. It's windier than hell down the, and going through that timber down there. And uh, you get hit in the head with one of those big green coconuts, it's lights out. Apparently kill a lot of people each year, right? Coconuts fall from the sky. So I found this trail right here and I went up this trail to get up the beaten path. See if I could find a comfy spot out of the wind to make some videos and share some voices. And I'm getting, uh, I've got mosquitoes all around me. And I nearly bit it here from a mosquito bite a few years ago, right? So, um, I don't think I'm going to be able to relax right here and read emails while there's mosquitoes around me and I don't have any bug dope with me. <laughs> Alright, so if I can't find a place to share these emails from on the way back, you're going to have to watch my adventure instead. And some boring as shit b-roll but whatever it's always i think it's probably better to watch some b-roll than my ugly mug read these emails anyway right so get out here before i die i'll be back in a minute all right this next one was a screenshot of a comment from the channel emailed to me all right now listen to this and obviously this person um 
It's okay to hear the name shared because they put it on the YouTube comments comment section. All right, so listen to this. Steve, this is from um, Lyle Graf. Steve, I was in a tree stand hunting deer back in 79 on my uncle's farm when I saw one of these things walk in under the tree I was in and kept going up the hill towards the top of this ridge. As it nears the top, all of a sudden, it kind of turned half around and kneeling at the same time. And as it did this, it turned into what looked like a tree stump. I then see two hunters. I then seen two hunters come across the top of the ridge and walk across it and went out of sight. This thing stood up and continued on its way. This thing, I guessed, around nine feet tall. And thankfully, I was dressed in camo, or I know it would have it would have been me. How's that for comment, right? But that's a uh, that's quite the detail. Let me read that again. All of a sudden, it kind of turned half around and kneeling at the same time and as it did this it looked it turned sorry as it did this it turned into what looked like a tree stump the masters of camouflage right i don't know how many times i've said in the past sometimes when i'm timber hunting in those big fir trees sometimes i think you know all i gotta do is start looking for those weird stumps and use my 10 by 56 swarovskis and sit and gaze at timber, not in between it. But then I thought, well, now nah, maybe I shouldn't do that because I'm probably gonna see something I don't really feel like seeing where I would be while doing it, which is about two hour fast hike out alone. Who needs that escort, right? Escort out. But that was quite the comment in the comments section. Now, listen to this. Silence, trees shaken, not stirred. Hi, uh, Steve. Sorry, this will be lengthy. God bless you. Family, pets, property, livestock. Greetings from Michigan. I'm 57. I've been hunting since I was legally allowed to hunt. Admittedly, a handful of years before that, while I adventured with a slingshot or recurve bow in my hands, I walked around the woods and fields terrorizing small game. Yeah, me too. So let's just say I've spent time in the woods, 45 plus years. Please refer to me only as Brian. I have two stories, not significant in the scheme of things. I also have two very important questions for Owlman, the Arizona Four, or any of your audience who occasionally are in contact with Sabe. First, my story. Though very minor, I found the situation unnerving enough to risk explaining it to my lifelong friends. This occurred in eastern Baraga, Baraga County, B-A-R-A-G-A -A -A County, in the upper peninsula of Michigan. Michigan uses a lottery system to draw bear tags. My buddy Dave, who is the subject of, a second, of, of the second story, he drew a bear tag in 99. I was not so lucky that year, and neither were any of our hunting buddies. He did not want to hunt alone in the third week of September. I said I would go with him. I said while he hunted bear, I would hunt coyotes and fish for brookies in the Sturgeon River Gorge. Dave's chosen bear stand was about a mile north of a paved Highway 41. This area is south of the La Anse Indian Reservation. It was accessible by a forest road, two tracks, and fire breaks. About a quarter mile back from the highway, there was an old homestead or farm. This was evident only by the overgrown cleared woods and very old apple trees. Any evidence of a home structure, root cellar, or well remained unseen. I set up there to call in coyotes. The overgrown field had evidence of a healthy population of rabbits and snowshoes. That and there were yoke tracks crossing the access road, heading in and out of the area. This event happened on my very first evening hunting. I dropped Dave off around 2 p.m. to start hunting for bear. After dropping him off, I drove south to my chosen yoke. I drove south to my chosen yoke spot. I sat up on the ground facing the overgrown field. I buried myself with my back to thick cover with the breeze in my face. I'd set up on an electric game call in a small bush about 80 feet away. It was a slightly warm day for September in the Upper Peninsula. If I remember, it was mostly sunny, temperature in the mid-60s. After 20 minutes of settle down time, I began random calls about 20 minute intervals. I could hear the occasional vehicle traveling down the highway. 
I was far enough away that I did not hear all the traffic. Loud trucks and semis. I'm certain I didn't hear any of the cars unless they had no muffler. I heard red squirrels, birds, cows, ravens, and the tree chops lightly sway in the breeze. I sat motionless with my 22 mag sitting on a bipod. I was expecting to see coyotes or a fox try to sneak in at any sneak in any moment. About 5 p.m., the wind came to a complete stop. Not unusual for pre-sunset, which should be around 7.30, and that is when everything went silent. Not just quiet, I mean the kind of silence that is eerie. I was like putting a pair of... I was like putting a pair of noise-canceling earphones, earphones on. So, I guess you must have meant... Sorry, you guys. It was like putting a pair of noise-canceling earphones on. I continued to trigger the game call. Now, when the rabbit in distress called out from the speaker, it shattered the silence. It was deafening. I heard no vehicle traffic. I did not hear any birds, rabbits, or squirrels. No bugs, and luckily no mosquitoes. I heard nothing but me breathing. I could hear my heart in my ears. I could hear every time I shifted my seat. Just me and the game call. I did not think for one moment that things went silent because a canine might be approaching. The possibility of a black bear approaching the dinner bell was highly unlikely as well. I continued this for over two hours. The sun was getting low and dipped below the trees. The field was completely shaded and a light breeze started again. I heard something move maybe 80 yards in the woods to my back. It was possibly a deer, maybe a coyote. Then a lone red squirrel chattered at the edge of the field. I almost let out a sigh of relief. I did, not, I did not wait until dark. I packed up, put my gear in the truck. I sat in the truck and waited until 30 minutes after dark to go pick up Dave. I told him about the eerie silence. He said he did notice the breeze died down a bit. He said there was no lack of, a, of normal. There was no lack of normal animal slash bird activity or silence. I chalked it up to paranoia or the isolated solace of the big woods. Second story, deer season 2004 in the Iron County, Western UP, Michigan. My buddy Dave was scouting an area hunting as he explored. There was five of us hunting the area and we drove in three separate, separate vehicles. Dave was hunting by himself about three or four miles from the nearest in the group. He was slowly walking down a fire break. He was walking slightly uphill and approaching about a three acre clearing. The clearing was fresh cut timber that the forest service had cleared the year before. The clearing was the top of a small hill. He approached slowly as deer may be browsing on the fresh new growth. He said there was only a slight breeze. That is when he witnessed the top of a fir tree on the opposite side of the hill rapidly shaking back and forth. He guessed the tree to be 40 feet tall. He could only see the top half of the tree. He took his 30 6 off his shoulder and froze in his tracks. At first he thought a bear or a moose. He determined that a bear or a moose could not whip a tree back and forth so violently. His gut told him that this was not normal and to leave. He backed out of the area, went back to his truck, and left. He was back at camp when we all returned from our hunt. He related the story to us. Then he said he was going to hunt a different area the next day. Of course, of course, we all said it might have been either a bear or a moose. He said we weren't there, and that was neither. He doesn't know what it was and didn't want to find out. We accepted what he said, no ridicule from our group, at least not about that. The following questions for the Owlman or the Arizona 4 may sound like they come from left field, but I have to ask, and I only hope for an answer. For those in contact with Sabe, please ask them. Number one, do they know any events from the near future? Number two, if they are aware, ask them white, ask, sorry, question number two. If they are aware, ask them white, what might occur around 2030 to 2031. Thanks, Steve. Appreciate all you do, and thanks for being a man. Thanks for providing a safe place for the people to share their stories. Thanks for being you, Brian from Michigan. Brian, the channel's nothing without people like you, man. So thank you for your time you just, you just sent to us. And now you left us hanging. Why don't you uh, give us a little heads or ups or what you think might be happening in the year 2030 slash 2031. You got me, you got me curious as hell. 
No secrets here, Brian. <laughs> we share everything here, man. But anyway, we'll see what kind of replies we get from that, if any. It'll be interesting, right? And if we don't, why don't you uh, throw us a bone and share with us what you're digging at so we can dig along with you. All right, what do we got here? This one's titled, I was frozen to my pillow. Hey, Steve, here is my story. I was sleeping in my bedroom, lying on my stomach with my head turned towards the wall and my face on my pillow. When I woke up, I knew someone was in my bedroom standing next to my bed, behind me and out of my sight. This is a very stressful time in my life as I was robbed at gunpoint a couple of weeks prior from a home invasion. Holy shit, no way. Because of a roommate's bad choices. I couldn't even imagine. There were five invaders with pistols, knives, assault rifles, and some wore masks and some didn't. No way. One put a gun to the back of my head and then ended up tying me up. So let's just say I was on edge at this time with very heightened senses. Do you think? So, back to the bedroom. I'm awake with my head on my pillow, with my handgun in my hand under my pillow. I thought a robber was back to kill me because I got a lot of them arrested and put in jail. So I thought it was them coming back. I was frozen in my pillow and bed, and I felt like a ton of bricks pushing me down, pushing down on me, making me not able to move like being physically controlled not to move. But I thought it was a bad guy and I knew I had to move fast, so I told myself I've got to move or I'm dead. So I tell myself I'm gonna count in my head to five and then I'm gonna move. One, two, three, four, five, boom. And I could move. And I sat up with my gun drawn in the direction of the intruder, but my room was empty. I jumped up, staying low and fast, checking my house in every room, looking for a bad guy or evidence. One got into my house and found no one anywhere. I had an ADT security system, all locked windows and doors, and had kicked the roommate out after the home invasion happened. Steve, I know there was something standing next to my bed, and I don't know if I was made frozen or fear froze me, but I would bet my life on it. Someone was there. Ghost, alien, monster, demon but not a bad human unless they were invisible or out of body. Thank you for what you have done for the people and the truth. I've been searching for the truth for a long time. I hunt and fish and have since I was little growing up in Washington State, not far from Mount Baker. I've never seen forest people, but I know they're out there. And my wife and I have seen a UFO twice, heard voices in our house, and she saw a ghost walking down a road when she was younger. They have been keeping the truth from us for a long time. It's all about control of this place we live, and that's why I think they keep it from us, like food, water, weather, mass, mass manipul manipulation from newspapers, radio, TV, and now the Internet. Why do you think it's called the Internet? Why do you, what do you do with a net? You catch something. That's why it's called the World Wide Web. What goes in webs? Flies. So I hope we're not the flies. Knowledge throughout history has always been about power. Knowledge is power and they have been keeping it from us. But now with more people coming forward on channels like yours, we will have the power. My name is Denny. I live in Washington, and I'm here for the truth and knowledge, and someday, maybe to kick the bad guy's ass. Also, the cold is the cold, and the last couple of years has been a joke, but not a joke for the ones who believed it or let fear control their health. Many friends, family, neighbors, and co-workers are dead now because of our controllers and evil ones treating us like cattle to the slaughter. People need to grow a backbone and stop letting fear control us all. I also want to say sorry for your loss of macaroni and love for your new dog. I've attached a video with audio of what I believe is a wolf. The location is rural. Deep, wet snow near Canada. Do you think it's a lone wolf? We do have some wolf packs in Washington, but this was... Pretty exciting, being so close to our home. Thanks for all you do and for letting the voices be heard, Denny. Okay, Denny, I'll listen to that, I'll listen to that uh, audio. I don't have it right here, the message, but I'll listen to it. Actually, I might have it. Let me have, let me have a look here. Okay, man, I found the video, I listened to it. It definitely sounds like a wolf to me. Some people might say it's a coyote, but that's exactly the same sound a wolf makes. <laughs> Believe me, I've heard a lot of wolves make that sound. And uh, just so you know, we've had, uh, there was a, a big male wolf was collared, radio collared in mid-north central British Columbia. 
and that sucker went all the way down to Oregon and back. <laughs> so there you go. The wolves don't know the borders, the, the imaginary borders that mankind has written down on a piece of paper, that's for sure, eh? Anyway, thanks for sending that in, man. Appreciate it. All right, here's another one. This is titled, Effigy Mounds Hairy Man. Steve, when I was a child visiting my grandparents' farm, I was exposed to what was described to me as the hairy man. My grandparents lived on a farm in northeast Iowa along the bluffs of the Mississippi Whip River. Some of the property had documented effigy mounds from the Native Americans dating back thousands of years. This area was studied extensively by archaeologists from many state universities. They did LIDAR, laser radar mapping of the whole area and my grandparents' property, property, a distinct serpent and turtle mound was found. They did LIDAR, laser radar mapping of the whole area, and on my grandparents' property, a distinct serpent and turtle mound was found. Both were located in the timbered area overlooking the Mississippi River. My grandfather took me there when I was young, and although you couldn't see what the radar mapping showed, there was a distinct mound formation. He told me that this is a sacred Native American site. We weren't allowed to walk over those mounds. The trees that were on or near the mounds were old growth majestic, some being at least 300 years old. My grandfather had such respect and honor to be the steward of this land. He would leave tobacco offerings near these mounds and fence the timber off so his cattle would not graze there. When I was old enough to deer hunt with my grandfather, he took me to one of his homemade tree stands on the edge of the woods overlooking a cut cornfield. This is across from the Serpent Mound. My grandfather was an excellent hunter, having taken several large bucks over the years. One afternoon, just before dark, a large figure entered the cornfield across from our tree stand. I thought it was another hunter, but there was nobody else hunting this land. It was scavenging for corn while keeping on alert. Let me read that again. It was scavenging, scavenging for corn while keeping on alert. I asked my grandfather what was that, and he told me to look away. I hid my face in my gloves as I heard my grandfather stand up in our tree stand and yell out that we were leaving and to please continue on feeding. I was so scared as I climbed down that ladder from the tree stand that I could barely move. My grandfather comforted me and told me not to worry. I started to cry and looked to my grandfather's reaction. He never brought a shotgun with him as he left it in the tree stand. He held my hand as we walked back to his house. When we got back, I was in shock. My grandmother laid me down in the floor in front of the fireplace. I heard my grandfather tell her that we saw the hairy man. I fell asleep for a few hours and awoke and was fed supper. Soon after, I went to bed and lay there as I heard my grandfather leave the house and he returned about 45 minutes later. I was still scared but felt safe in their house. The next morning, about 4.30 a.m., my grandfather woke me to head out to go hunting. I was so scared. My grandfather told me everything is going to be fine. We walked back to our tree stand in the dark, and I held on to my grandfather's hand, and I noticed that he had a shotgun with him. As we got into the tree stand, I was anxious to look out as the sun came up. About 10 minutes after sunrise, a huge buck came into view. About 10 minutes after sunrise, a huge buck came into view, and I saw my grandfather raise his shotgun up, and he dropped that buck in the cornfield. After half hour, we climbed down and went to the buck. My grandfather gutted it, and we dragged it out of the field. The whole time, I was expecting the, quote, hairy man, end quote, to come out of the woods. We then walked back, got the tractor, and hauled the deer back to his barn. A few years later, I asked my grandfather about that day that we saw the hairy man. My dad was with me, and he never said a word. According to my grandfather, the hairy man would come stay near the effigy mounds in the fall on their migration south for the winter. He didn't know if I was scared. Sorry. He didn't know if it was sacred ground to them or if they just liked this area. He felt a spiritual connection to the mounds and would always give the hairy man space when they showed up. They never threatened him over the decades they visited my grandparents' farm. 
Some years they never showed up, but my grandfather said he never went there to look for them either. My father still owns my grandparents' farm. He told me that it will be mine someday. The effigy mounds are still there. The ranchers have been told not to disturb them, and they respect the land. About 12 years ago, I was put under hypnotic... Sorry. About 12 years ago, I was put under hypnosis to address this incident. Although I don't remember being under hypnosis, the incident was documented exactly how I am telling you by my doctor. And this has helped me with my anxiety that creeps out into my mind since that day I saw the hairy man. I also reached out to a representative from the Fox Indian tribe. They wouldn't discuss the hairy man with me, as it was not allowed. They explained to me that the effigy mounds could be the site of a burial or a place for ceremony for the early woodland tribes that dominated the area thousands of years ago. Thank you for reading about my hairy man sighting. Wow. That's another holy shitter, isn't it? And how many people have we heard of, both First Nations and non-First Nations, who just live right alongside, had respect, matter-of-fact knowledge, and um, didn't need to be talking about it, gave them their space, and they treated it with respect, and they got it back. And those mounds are something else. I wonder what's in there. Not that I would want to go dig anything up, and I wouldn't, not a chance. Holy cow, man. And you had to go get some therapy too, huh? I think a lot of people should, actually. And therapy's not a, a bad thing or something to be ashamed about. It's just tools. That's all it is. You know, whatever you call it, a shrink, a psychologist, a doctor, they just got tools. Tools and methods that can help our brains um, function a little better. That's it. It's nothing bad. It's nothing to be ashamed of. People that, people that actually go on their own to go get more tools for their mind are brave people. Brave, smart, intelligent people. But anyway, that's quite the share. I'm glad you shared it, man. I'm super stoked you shared it to show people that you can. Well, I guess it depends on who's coming to your property, though, right? I mean, we can say it's, it's, um, it's, it's definitely a fact. We live alongside these beings. That's all there is to it, especially where we were just talking about Pyramid and Mount Curry. I mean, if you guys, you know, we always hear about Oklahoma, East Texas, Ohio, Utah, Oregon be hotbeds for activity i don't think i know of anywhere that had more uh, more activity than where i have been living the last 16 18 years the uh, triangle of north vancouver squamish pemberton and uh, obviously we're living right alongside these beings no problem for the most part except for people being terrified but then there's the portal thing and there's people that have gone missing around there unexplained i mean every single thing went missing the backpacks not even a sock has been left and that shit's kind of unnerving. Is it coincidence that that shit's going on where these beings are all the time? I don't know. Having a clue. Somebody does. But anyway, I gotta get moving. I got a bunch of other stuff to do. And there's so much background noise around here. It's driving me freaking insane. <laughs> but I'll be back shortly. I'm really looking forward to getting home. Actually. But anyway, keep, keep sharing your experiences, you guys. There's nothing to be ashamed of or scared of. And you heard enough people here, you've heard enough people here say it out loud that sharing their experiences here helped them a lot. All right? Share my story at howtohunt.com.